And uh, don't get distracted by the ice cream. The ice cream is a little sweetener because you may have realised already that the title of our message uh, series for this month is called I Tithe. No, it's not. It's called Because I Tithe. <laughs> and uh, what I want you to hear right from the outset is that we're going to spend two months uh, talking about the kingdom of heaven's financial principles and how they're actually quite starkly different from some of the principles that you will learn in the world around you if you study kind of finance or business or uh, just you know wisdom around finances some of it will be the same and some of it is quite starkly different but what i want you to hear is that we are not bringing this series to you as a result of you know some of the things that luke brought to us earlier that fact that you know we have a vacant space that we need to be filled and we have a an area of financial provision in our church as, a, as a, com, a church community where we need to see God move. No, in fact, we've had this on the calendar for this month of the year since about October last year. And uh, it's come out of a personal conviction from Luke and I as your pastors, the people who God has appointed for this moment in time, uh, you know, in this church community to bring leadership, uh, where we did not talk about money for I reckon the first five to seven years of our leadership of this church. And that's because this church has a really checkered history when it comes to finance and financial management. And, you know, we've both been a part of this church our entire adult lives, Luke, even since he was a kid. And we'd been a part of that story. We'd seen the financial mismanagement. We'd seen our tithes that we were bringing be used for, th for purposes that were, you know, unethical and not, not wise. And so we, as young leaders, were afraid to bring to the church messages about financial principles and also we knew that we had to get our house in order. Good leaders get what's unseen in order before they start telling people what they should do with their lives. Isn't this the truth? Like good leaders get their own marriage in order before they start bringing wisdom to other people about their marriages. Good parents get their kids in order and get them kind of on track before they re realise that they've got anything to bring to others about how they should parent their children. And so financial management is no different. We could see that we had some things that we needed to get in order and we spent a few years doing that. And uh, then we had a personal conviction a few years ago, I can't remember exactly when, that completely transformed our own theology, leadership and practice around this spiritual principle of tithing. And ever since God did that work in our hearts and our leadership, we've brought to our church every year, we create space for it every year to teach and lead and disciple our church, have conversations together about these spiritual principles. Because what we realised, the revelation we received, is that we were ripping the people of God off we were absolutely only bringing part of what God has to say about how the community of God lives a flourishing, safe, healthy, unshakable life if we didn't ever touch this topic. And so we have a deep and unapologetic conviction about bringing to our church, sharing in a conversation with our church each year, some of these financial principles. So for this month, we're going to talk about tithing specifically. Next month, we're going to talk about some other principles like generosity and generational planning and, you know, getting your house in order, budgeting, that kind of thing. And um, so the series for this month is called Because I Tithe. But what I thought I would do, because I get to bring the first message, is I've called today's message, I Tithe Because because it's always helpful to know why somebody else tithes. And I hope that we're a safe and healthy enough church community that especially in our life groups where we have these deeper conversations, we're sharing with each other some of the reasons why we tithe and some of the stories of how we've come to that decision in our theology and practice. So first of all, some of you might be going, well, what the heck is tithing? What are you talking about? It's a word that simply means a tenth, and it's an ancient spiritual practice and discipline, which simply means to bring the first tenth of your financial provision to God through the gathered people of God, through the local church. And we're going to take a walk through 
scripture to see how this principle has remained uh, uh, consistent throughout the entire arc of the biblical narrative. Okay, so we're going to go through some Bible here. We're going to start in the book of Deuteronomy. The the book of Deuteronomy is uh, one of the books of the law in the Old Testament. It comes after God has rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. So the people of God, the community of God, uh, the people that are being spoken to in Deuteronomy are the same kind of people that we are today. We are the community of God, the people of God. And uh, this is his very first instruction to them. He's rescued them from slavery. They've been under oppression. They've had to live their lives the way that they've been told by the Egyptian rulers. And now they're in an in-between space. They're in the wilderness, right? They're not yet in the promised land that God's you know, telling them is coming, but they have to learn how to be a community together. Every society has to know how to be a safe flourishing, healthy community together. And uh, what we know, because the Bible teaches us and now sociology and medicine and all kinds of other sciences will tell us, is that we need boundaries. (laughs) We're safe when we have boundaries. And so God gives them the very first list of boundaries, not to be a spoil sport, not to make them think that they're back under slavery and oppression again, but to teach them how they live the best and most flourishing, safe, secure existence that they could ever hope or dream of. And so that's where the Ten Commandments comes in, the command to Sabbath, take one full day of rest out of every seven. So that's a boundary God's put on our time so that we don't overwork and run ourselves ragged. And so here we come to the command about tithing. Deuteronomy 12, there are, these are the decrees and regulations you must be careful to obey when you live in the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. When you get there and you're starting to practice the discipline now, you must obey them as long as you live. Do not worship the Lord your God in the way these pagan peoples worship their gods. Rather, you must seek the Lord your God at the place of worship he himself will choose from among all the tribes. The place where his name will be honoured. Right from the very beginning, he's saying, the people of God come together and there is a place where we practice our worship together and where we honour the name of God together. And he's preparing them for a time when this will be a physical place. There you will bring your burnt offerings your sacrifices, your tithes, your sacred offerings, your offerings to fulfill a vow, your voluntary offerings, and your offerings of the firstborn animals of your herds and flocks. Wow, notice this. He's not just asking them to bring 10%. He's asking them to bring a whole range of offerings, a whole range, so, so much more than 10%. The tithes is just one of those offerings that he's asked them to bring. There, you and your families will feast Oh, come on, how good's that? We had a feast last week. There, when you're the gathered people, when everybody's contributing, everybody's giving something, everybody's bringing their costly worship, there you get to feast in the presence of the Lord your God and you will rejoice in all you have accomplished because the Lord your God has blessed you goes on to say in Deuteronomy 28 verse 9, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he promised you on oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. And that's why the first point, the first reason why I tithe is because God asked me to. It's actually a matter of obedience. And some of you say, well, that's the, you know, that's the very first community of the people of God. It was quite primitive back then. They were an agricultural people. They were bringing their kind of source of provision and safety and security was livestock and crops. And so that's why they were bringing the first 10% of their livestock animals and the first 10% of their crops, their harvest from everything that they were planting. Uh, but then we get to a money economy and a precious stones economy and a precious metals economy. And so let's have a look at a couple of verses that surround, you know, there's, I'm not going to go through the whole Old Testament here, but it's in general, the building and then rebuilding of the temple of God, an actual physical place 
for God's people to meet together and where it says in the word that God will meet his people. And I mean, there's just so much detail in the Bible about how grand and opulent this temple was and in its rebuilding as well. So in 2 Chronicles 31 verse 5, it says, When the people of Israel heard these requirements, this is what was needed for the building of the temple, they responded generously by bringing the first share of their grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and all the produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. If we fast forward to Malachi, the end of the Old Testament now, you can see where we're talking more about money as well. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, the temple, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try me and put it, uh, try it, put me to the test. It's the one place in all of scripture where God invites his people to test him in the principle. He knows, he knows that right throughout human history, we're going to be so tempted to find our safety and security from what we can build for ourselves, building our nice homes and mowing our nice yards and driving our nice cars and progressing in our nice jobs and dressing our nice children in nicely branded clothes. He knows that we're always going to be tempted to do those things and have those things as forefront in our minds. And so he invites us in this one place, in this one area that's so hard for us to remain faithful to, to test him. He says, well, put it to the test. See, see if I'll bless you. See if I'll pour out way more than what you could ever put into my house. And now we come to the New Testament. And uh, we can see that tithing was still a principle and a practice for the community of God in the New Testament. You know, theologically, we know that because Jesus came uh, and created a whole new way of, of living, that the law was abolished. All of those rules from Deuteronomy didn't have to be observed in the same ways and with the same punishments. However, the principles still applied. We absolutely were still expected not to murder. We still absolutely were being asked to be honest and not lie. We still absolutely were being asked not to be envious of the things that the people around us were able to have. And so Paul, the Apostle Paul, as he's you know, trying to lead and teach this you know, new community of people, this whole new way of living in this whole new generation where it wasn't so much about the temple anymore, but, oh gosh, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and we're still asked to come together and worship together, but outwork our faith in families and house churches and keep the message about Jesus moving throughout the earth so that everybody else can be set free and know this new way to live. So Paul speaks specifically specifically to the area of tithing and financial generosity. He says, on the first day of each week, we'll call that Sunday, you should put aside, in our culture, you should put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and try to collect it all at once. We see right there, he's still saying, bring a portion He's still saying, bring it every week, make it a discipline. Don't wait, don't hold off, don't wait until you've paid all the other bills and see if there's any left. Bring it, decide how much you're bringing and bring it. And then over in 2 Corinthians, he's telling this, he's writing this letter uh, and he's trying to encourage the Corinthian church to um, stay faithful to what they've said that they were going to do and remain true to being the people that they've said that they want to be. And so he says this, I really need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. You know, right throughout the whole biblical narrative, those those offerings that were received to the temple of God were used not just to honour God, but for the provision of the community of God and particularly for the provision of the people who, whose calling was to lead the worship and lead uh, spiritually the people of faith. So he's saying he's asked them to bring a, an offering for the believers in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help. 
And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. So Paul's saying, like, don't let me down here. I've been saying that this is who you said you wanted to be. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. Wow, that's a challenge. Am I so enthusiastic in my giving that I'm actually inspiring and encouraging other people to begin learning that discipline and sacrifice as well? He goes on to say, but I'm sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready, as I've been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But... I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. So just be free of that today. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Lord, let that be the story of my life. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. He's saying you're actually going to help them to grow spiritually because you're going to show them that they should be thanking God and so grateful that he's provided for them. For your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Clearly, there's a lot in there, and we could probably do six months worth of the Bible and theology about tithing. But for me, one of the reasons that I tithe is because God's asked me to. And I hope that I've been able to show you through the Bible why that's true. The second reason I tithe is because order matters. And tithing is also known as the principle of the first. Because the order in which we do things matters. You know, your morning routine matters. It sets you up for a successful day or not. The order in which we spend our time and our money matters. The order in which we share good news matters which I learnt again recently because I don't know if you've been living under a rock, but we've just recently celebrated an engagement in our house. Uh, Us and the Hamilton family uh, in Mutual have shared a celebration uh, in the engagement of Tom and Zara. So I'm going to ask them up to come and help me uh, be my... This is like part of marriage preparation. Yeah, this is the engagement party. We're having ice cream cake. Uh, because, you know, on, the, on that fateful day when these two guys got engaged, we had to tell a lot of people and it mattered who we told first because you don't just go blurting it all out there on Instagram for who knows who to see before you've told your grandparents yeah. and the people that matter. So the order in which... <laughs> yep, round of applause for the grandparents. <laughs> the grandpa Stu was here last week. Round of applause for Stu if you're watching. <laughs> The order in which we do things matters. And so God has given us so much help 
about where the wise boundary settings should go in how we spend our time. And that's the principle of work and Sabbath rest. Money, that's the principle of tithing and kingdom financial principles. And even things like how we build our relationships to keep us safe and healthy and help us to build unbreakable lives. You might know this verse from Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. He knows we're a wanting people. I was in Noosa this week, long story. And as you walk down Hastings Street, Noosa, it is so easy to want things because there are so many beautiful things and all these boutique stores that you walk past and you have to push past the desire of wanting, whether it's delicious food, food, whether it's gelato, when every second shop is a gelato shop, whether it's boutique clothing, whether it's surfboards, whatever it is, you have to be able to push past all the wanting. And God says, if you choose to put me first in your life, then all the other things that are important will be added to you. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honour God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst and your wine vats will brim over. All right, I've been talking for long enough. Pretty sure that the ice cream cakes will be sufficiently melted. I've asked Tom to be the slicer and Zara to be the deliverer because I didn't trust Zara's math skills. (laughs) And I was going to pre-mark the ice cream cakes into like 10% portions, but the Freddo ice cream cake has got 10 blobs. So we've had a little practice of our maths. Three blobs equals 30%, two blobs equals 20%. No, yes, 5% is half a blob, which is, Zara said, Zara said in rehearsal, 5% is half a cake, (laughs) which is why she's not doing the cutting. Okay, so cake number one, we're going to pretend that we're the typical Australian household who doesn't tithe, and we're going to see what happens if you don't tithe first, okay? This is what we're illustrating here. Okay, so let's, let's say that we're average Australian Joe, and we're in the 30% tax bracket, okay? So our income has us paying about 30% of what we earn in tax first, comes out before you even see it. So, Thomas, are you confident in doing a 30% slice? Very confident. confident. And then while you... Okay, let's hurry up. 30%, 30%. I'm just going to keep an eye on you. There you go. Yep. Oh, he's shaking. He's nervous. Um, Okay, while he's cutting, put your hand up if you don't like ice cream cake or can't eat ice cream cake. Oh, there's a few. Zara, are you paying attention? Who can't have ice cream cake or doesn't want ice cream cake? Put your hand up if you love ice cream cake. There's a very strong a lot of show of hands up at the sound desk. Okay, so these guys don't know who tithes and who doesn't. Neither do I. So we're not giving it out based on who the greatest tithers are. So 30% tax slice. Zara, go and find a recipient of the 30% tax slice of the cake. <laughs> Woo! Oh, where's she gonna go? It's a big one. Oh. Yeah. Very generous. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay, let's say you're going to the bank and you would like to buy a house, the great Australian dream. And uh, the bank is assessing (laughs) you, as they do, every detail of your life to decide whether they'll lend you money so that you can buy a house. They're going to make sure that your housing expenses are only about 30% of what you earn. So we've got another 30% slice here just for our housing expenses. I've learned even in rental situations now, they are assessing your ability to pay your rent against your income and it's still about that 30% mark. So we've got a set, oh, crikey, it's a big slice. We've got a second 30% slice. Give her a wave if you want it. The cake's getting melted. Oh. Might need to open. 
Might need to open the church playground after the service and <laughs> run off a bit of that sugar. Um, now, for these next couple, I looked at the main family budget and I've rounded gotcha. for Tom so that it's make it simple. So in the main family budget, we spend about 10% on groceries because we're a six-person household. It's a lot of money on groceries. So we got a 10% slice there for somebody. In the main family budget, we spend about 10%, again, I've rounded, on house-related expenses. So things like insurance, water, energy rates, those kinds of things, about 10%. Um, in the main family budget, we spend about 10% on school and children-related expenses like piano lessons and again, four children, geez, it's expensive, 10%, wow, might stop having those piano lessons or, anyway, um, in the main household, we spend about 5% of our budget on car expenses, uh, two vehicles, you know, six people, people going in different directions, that ends up being expensive as well. Um, so what I've realised is we're about, oh, you're, you're getting behind, Tom. There you go. Got it. Yeah, haven't done 5%. There you go. 5% for the car. Yep. Car, petrol, insurance, registration. Whew. There it goes. There it goes. Yes. Come on. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so what, we've, what we're up to is we've now spent 95% of the first cake. And do you know what we haven't paid for? We haven't paid for any entertainment, any subscriptions, no Netflix. No holidays, no, in the main family budget, we've got a line called leadership development because we value that, we write a values-based budget. We've got a line for marriage enrichment. Uh, there's no money left for marriage enrichment. I haven't even brought a tithe. I haven't even allowed any money for generosity or to be financially generous to people. And what's more, look at what this last piddly 5% looks like. <laughs> it's an absolute mess. If you were at my house, there is no way I would give that to you. I'd hide it in the freezer and make that be my slice later after everyone's gone home because there's no offering in that. That's not generous. I would be ashamed and embarrassed to bring you, cut you a slice of ice cream cake at Main Mansion that looked like that. Yeah. Alternatively, if we were to bring our tithe first... The tithe being 10%. I mean, the knife's a bit dirty, so is the illustration going to work? Nobody gets this slice. We're setting it aside for the Lord. But if you hang back for morning tea, maybe he'll share it with you. <laughs> Including the rest of I reckon we give the rest of cake two to the kids team yeah. who weren't here to get any ice cream today. Yeah. When you bring the first... 10%. I mean, I'm not really convinced that that looks a whole lot nicer <laughs> than the last 5%. No, it's fine. The principle is that when we bring the first 10%, it's actually a gift. It actually is, is costly. It, it, it's actually the person who gets the first is typically the person of honour at the birthday party where we're giving the slice of ice cream cake. The first piece goes to the birthday person, the person of honour. And that's why the principle of the first matters. All right, thank you guys. You can get rid of all that for me. And yes, thank you. We'll put the rest of those cakes in the freezer. Maybe you'll get some at morning tea. So the first reason I tithe is because God asked me to. The second reason I tithe is because order matters. The order in which we do things matters. And the third reason I tithe is because I'm maturing. I'm maturing. This year, in my family, I wrote a budget where the leftover 90%, the rest of that second cake after tithing, looked like it was going to be way less than what I actually needed to get through the year, just on basic essentials. I'd already cut out all the discretionary spending, all the Netflix, all the everything. But as somebody who's been faithfully tithing for many years now, I absolutely did not consider cutting out that part of my budget. 
And so I'm, not, I'm certainly not here to tell you that it's been an easy year or that that decision is easy. In fact, it's costly worship. But as part of doing that and my commitment to that decision, my relationship with God has grown deeper and it's made room for God to demonstrate his miraculous provision in my family's life in entirely new ways that we've never experienced before. Tithing is a huge test of our maturity as followers of Jesus because it is so costly. It's no small sacrifice to bring a full 10% before any other expenses, even tax, of our financial increase to God as the first thing we do when new money comes to us. And the, the older I get, the more I understand what really matters. And the longer I faithfully tithe, the more I learn I can trust in God's provision in every season of my life, whether things feel abundant or lacking. It becomes not about what I feel anymore. It's part of my worship. It's a costly sacrifice. You know, David was somebody who had followed after God's heart and he developed his spiritual maturity over lots of twists and turns and through lots of bends in his life, lots of mistakes, lots of God's forgiveness. And uh, this story has been really sitting with me in my year this year where David had made, he'd made a mistake. He decided to count all of his stuff. He was like a king counting his money, like in the old nursery rhyme. And he was counting his troops because when we count things, uh, it helps us feel more safe and secure about the things that we've built. When we look at the bank account and there's enough there that we've, you know, we've kept there, we feel good about ourselves because we've built something that's stable and secure. And God said, no, David, you're not meant to be counting your troops. Your safety and provision and security comes from me. And so there was this plague that was throughout the kingdom that D David had leadership of. And David knew he had this alone time with God. He was convicted. He knew he'd made a mistake and he had to change it. And so he goes to find anywhere where he can bring an offering and make a sacrifice. And uh, we'll pick it up in 1 Chronicles 21. This guy Aruna sees David approaching. He left his threshing floor and bowed before David the king with his face to the ground. David said to Aruna, let me buy this threshing floor from you at its full price. Then I will build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. And Aruna says, take it, my Lord, the king, and use it as you wish. You know, that's what you do when you're a loyal subject and you're honouring your king. You give whatever you have to help the cause. And um, he said, I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings and I'll give the threshing boards for wood to build a fire on the altar and I'll give the wheat for the grain offering. I'll give it all to you. But King David replied to Aruna, no, I insist on buying it for the full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. I will not present burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. So David gave Aruna 600 pieces of gold in payment for the threshing floor. David built an altar there to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And when David prayed, the Lord answered him by sending fire from heaven to burn up the offering on the altar. He got to experience God in a new way. He made room in his life to see a miracle of God that he hadn't seen before. God sent fire from heaven to burn up the sacrifice on the altar. He, he went to a new level in his trust with God, in his maturity, in his spiritual growth and development. And all these generations later, for those of us who've said yes to Jesus, as mature disciples and followers of Jesus, we're always growing. And tithing helps us grow in our honour of God. Tithing helps us grow in our trust in His provision. Tithing helps us reap a harvest of generosity in our lives where generations will tell of our works. And being a mature follower of Jesus and tithing helps us grow in gratitude. We've just become so aware that every good thing we have 
came from God in the first place. And it's not much to bring the first 10% as an offering back to Him. Would you close your eyes? I just want to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. This message, my prayer, has been, would be liberating for you. I've uh, had the privilege of spending some time with some younger people who've got big dreams about their finances recently and been helping them with budgeting, practical stuff. It's, it's true discipleship, right? When we're mature followers of Jesus, we bring people who are newer in their faith and we show them how to practically live their lives. And it's just been so exciting for me to see a process of budgeting and setting aside the first 10% to tithe actually empower these people to dream the dreams, to put their, their trust in God and believe that God will abundantly bless them and provide for their every need. And so I just pray right now that whatever God's speaking to you in this moment, that you'll be open to whatever He's saying and that you'll feel free after the conversation, that you'll feel like you're, you've grown in your spiritual development as a part of the conversation. And if there is anybody in our gathering or even online who's never committed to being a follower of Jesus, never committed to following in the footsteps, becoming a disciple of Jesus, then this is your moment. We're going to pray a prayer together in just a second. And uh, if you want this prayer to be a marker moment in your life, then just show me by raising your hand. And then we as the whole community are going to pray this prayer together, committing ourselves to being followers of Jesus for the rest of our lives. Just going to leave a moment for whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You can raise your hand if you would like. Let's pray together. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. And fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit.